Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range U.S.-focused forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Well, I think we've all had enough time over the last few days here to kind of digest what our current planting progress numbers are. You know, sitting here at the beginning of the week at 68% across the country, you know, we know that we're in record territory blowing past 2013 and 1995. Uh, but one thing I want to really point out here is let's just say that if we if we say that on average, you know, what are we looking at? Well, we should have been somewhere, um, you know, uh, much, of course, almost entirely planted. But if we just want to know how far behind this crop is, we basically just take this right back over to what would have been the five-year planting progress back on week uh, 18 or 19. And so we can clearly see that we're somewhere between three and four weeks behind on this crop. And that's what's important. Now, what regions are most behind? corn planting progress over there on the left, soybean on the right. So you can clearly see it's going to be much of the eastern corn belt that's really in delay here in terms of both crops, but also parts of South Dakota. So the question is, who's been making progress this week? So we look at just the last 48 hours of precipitation. Now, there is quite a bit of white on this graph, and we can see that there's going to be a lot of folks riding through here that made quite a bit of progress and in parts of South Dakota that didn't get hit by thunderstorms. But remember, last weekend's rain kind of snuffed out parts of, uh, you know, of Ohio, and then we've had this complex of thunderstorms that started off a few days ago through Minnesota that swept into parts of northern Iowa and, and eastern Iowa and then hit northern Illinois very hard. There are parts of northern Illinois that have actually gone over the last 45 days, 30 of those 45 days they've had rain. And so that is one place that has some very productive ground that has been in trouble. But certainly where I've put some of those circles, especially right in through uh, here uh, and up in here, there was progress made in some locations that were, were pretty far behind. Uh, but still, this is not the planting pace that we'd want to see. Just looking over the last 14 days, we can see who's in deficit and who is not. And uh, when we look at the departure from normal, so this is measured in inches, we get up to my darkest blues here, we're talking about more than five inches uh, of rain in the last in the, that time period. So you can see the big ridge we've been talking about for a while, keeping the southeast dry. Well, changes are coming. Now, normally, if you were to show me a jet stream pattern just like this and say, ah, this is what you're getting in mid-June, I'd say, okay, we got a little shortwave sneaking through the flow here, uh, here at the first week of June, and that could possibly kick off some, some stronger showers and thunderstorms in this corridor, but it's not going to be a main soaking event. And the reason why is the main polar jet stream is way up here in Canada. I would normally look at this and say, this is going to be a warmer pattern, and this is going to be a pattern that's going to be a lot of hit or miss showers and thunderstorms. But what you can't see is what's underneath this ridge right down here. And that is this tropical system that is sneaking its way up into Texas, Louisiana today. In the meantime, where that trough was sneaking through, we're still going to watch a battery where they're going to be expecting to possibly see some strong to severe storms in this corridor right in through here and a general risk of thunderstorms outside of that. So the pattern, even though the jet stream has retreated to Canada, is still very active. And that tropical system coming out of the Bay of Campeche, look at the precipitable water. So this just tells me how juiced the atmosphere is. This is just a snapshot Wednesday afternoon. Look at the moisture plume that's heading to the north here. Now the big question is, where is it going? So if we just look over the next uh, week, all the way up to next Wednesday, middle of the day, this is total accumulated precipitation. And that tropical pulse is going to basically come up and sit in the south and I've been talking about in my uh, forecast videos that the northern edge of this is going to be the trickiest thing to forecast. Look across the state of Illinois. Southern half may get an inch to two, maybe three inches. Northern half, while we're watching out for scattered showers and thunderstorms, it's, it's drier because the system doesn't fully sneak up there. Also, over in the eastern Corn Belt, we've seen the models bounce around quite a bit in Indiana and Ohio, still wet. But remember, keep, we got to keep this in perspective of any rain especially in Ohio right now, is too much rain, given how much they've recently had. In the North Central Plains, a couple of rounds over the next week that they could be getting some thunderstorms, but overall, planting windows remain largely open. If I were to see this map and you didn't tell me how bad things were leading into it, I'd be like, hey, this is a fantastic map. People are going to be getting rain in mid-June. Remember, we're having to treat June as if it was May, given the delays in planting. Now, I want to show you this. This is the European model versus the GFS. And if I kind of toggle back and forth, Euro, GFS, you can see major differences in the model. And all of the differences are in the treatment of the upper level trough that swings through here and the position, timing, uh, and, and progression of the, of the tropical pulse coming out of the, uh, you know, out of the Bay of Campeche and, and, and out of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. 
So major differences here in precipitation. And as you know, and I've given reason for this, I default back to the European model because of its performance statistics. All right. Looking out longer term, let's just show you what's going on through day five. So this is valid now through June 10th. We do see a trough that is developing right here in the central uh, kind of Canadian prairies. And that is what's going to give us a couple of chances for storms both this weekend in the northern plains and then early next week. Here's what the European model is doing with that trough that's coming through Texas, New Mexico today and the tropical system that's starting here, it's going to take it over to the southeast. By day 10, we see that the trough is now fully established over the Great Lakes states between there and the Hudson Bay. And the flow pattern goes back into something like this. Now, in this particular flow pattern, this is a flow pattern that tends to be drier in parts of the North Central Plains, although we tend to get thunderstorms out of that Northwest flow. This is a pattern that is also significantly cooler. What about day 15? So now I've got you out here to uh, June 20th. When we see it, one major feature that I'm going to be watching carefully for is what's going on off the Aleutian Islands and is the jet stream really going into a split pattern out west? If it does, we're going to have to watch out for less predictable weather patterns in the longer term across this flattened jet stream in the middle part of the United States. It really removes longer range predictability. And let's just go on out to day 20. So this is valid June 25th. And again, I'm watching this and I'm watching the potential for split flow out west. The question is, will the ridge set up here as the European model is suggesting, be building toward those four corner states? And that is an important question we're going to talk about in just a few seconds. Now, when you compare the next 15 days by the European model on the left with the US model, the GFS, on the right, these are both looking at their ensembles, and we're looking here at differences from normal. So this is anomaly here. You can see that the northern plains, some of the Great Lakes states, are forecast dry, drier than normal. Let me be very clear about that, drier than normal. Why is the GFS then saying that it's not? One of the big differences is happening in the pattern beyond day 10. You see, the European model wants to feature a trough that's out here. The GFS wants it temporarily to be right there, just for a few days. But that difference is what brings in a lot of this uh, excess precipitation. Now, you know I'm going to default back to the European model on this. This is not to say there won't be any precipitation in this corridor. This is just comparing it to average. Now, the southeast, they need this. They need it, they need steady rain for a few days to help alleviate some of the drought and dry pressure that's going on there. I am concerned, given the, the kind of longevity of this next system, that we could be seeing some localized flooding. So it's just been back and forth and back and forth across this region in the United States. Pacific Northwest, you are in a drier pattern. Both models agree on that. So at least that's one thing that we can kind of hang our hats on. What about temperature patterns? Well, this is at least something the models do agree on. We see that in the near term, so this is over the next five days, this region is going to be experiencing warmer temperatures. And that's just overall because the jet stream is doing this, right? So because of that cooler time period in the Pacific Northwest, warm in the Central Plains. But by day 10, so this is the day 6 through 10 time period, we start to go back into this pattern that's going to be doing something like this. And that trough that is sitting right over the Great Lakes states is what's going to keep a lot of us in the central US cool. By day 15, which is over here on the right, we still see that we hang on to that cooler pattern. And that brings up a very important point. Because last night, we have the brand new long range outlook from the European model. This is the, called the European monthlies. And they're keeping the Pacific Northwest warm. And they're keeping this quarter of the United States cool. Now, I know you look at this and go, holy smokes, but look at the color bar. This is just three degrees cooler than average. Regardless of that, what we are seeing is a late start to the growing season, a very late plant, and unlike a year ago, where in May and June we rapidly accumulated growing degree to units, the current forecast does not hold that for the center part of the country. Southeast, warm. Parts of the northern Corn Belt, the Canadian prairies, forecasted to be warmer than average. But there's a region in the middle part of the country which you've now seen is wet and also warm. What would we need for this to be really dry? Well, I'm just going to zoom in from the North Pole. So you're looking right down. If this was going to be a hot and dry time period, look, I'd want to see a big ridge sitting just south of the Aleutian Islands and a deep plunging trough just off the West Coast. That leads to a big ridge here just to the west of the Great Lakes states and a trough just off the Northeast. That's the flow pattern we want with some good high latitude blocking here and another deep trough over Eastern Europe. That's what we need to have a warm, dry June. 
And what are we getting? Well, this takes you out in the last week of June. Where we need a ridge, we have a trough. Where we need a trough, we have a ridge. Where we need a ridge, we have a trough. You see how it's out of phase? And this is why the European model is picking up on a June that is not going to be the most favorable conditions. Now, if you asked me, and I've talked to several people about this, what favorable would be for June, July, and August, we'd actually want to get warm and wet. Warm and wet. We'd want to stay wet. We just need to stay wet. If we're going to start wet, stay wet. But the warmth would help us start to accumulate, not hot and wet, but warm and wet. And right now, what we're seeing here is a cooler and wetter pattern as we progress forward. What about the month of July? Look, we're still hanging on to that cooler pattern here, warm in the northwest, warm in the Canadian prairies, warm over the southeast. But the models are hanging on to this cooler, wetter bias through the month of July. Now remember, you need to treat this forecast map, if you're comparing it to a normal year, as if it was June. Because we saw at the beginning, maybe we're three to four weeks late in this season, and if the progression is not fast, we're talking about a pollination time period that instead of being at the end of June, beginning of July for the Midwest, it's now at the end of July, maybe the beginning of August. So this is what the brand new long range model updates are suggesting. Now, if the models are right, these are the things I'm most concerned about. And I've talked about them, slow progression of the season, pollination dates are pushed back. I'm not a disease expert, but people tell me this is the kind of season that we have to watch out for this. What about the stand quality, root structure? Those are all big unknowns given what we've had to plant into. And our soybeans are gonna miss the summer solstice. Is there any hint of a pattern change at all this summer? To answer that question, I'm just gonna show you this. Right now, we still have a weak El Nino. When you look at the map that's animating over in the bottom right, this circle that I've got here is the same as that circle over here, okay? So when you look at that, that's the surface of the ocean and this is depth. You can see cooler water from the depths kind of resurging back toward the surface. And as they do that, that's gonna weaken the El Nino event. That's the first part. We've already seen a weakening in the El Nino by looking at the change in the westerly wind bursts we had been seeing back in May and April. I talked a lot about that in the last video. So this is seeing that the atmosphere and the ocean are both responding. Next, this is an area that I'm concerned about. Remember, I've been talking about this. If we see a lot of cold water extending here, that is an indication that later in the summer we could be seeing some heat. Now this is not yet to the extent to be worried. We'd want to see cold all the way up in the Gulf of Alaska, stretching down into whole, this whole region right in through here. Okay, where I just colored white, we want all that to be cool. We don't have that. It's there, but it's got to expand to be a serious contender moving forward. But this has me right now not trusting any long range forecast. That's why. That's why I'm telling you this. Finally, what about hurricane season? Well, we know what NOAA has said about this upcoming hurricane season. We've seen some of the more recent releases from the Colorado State University. And I'll tell you this, what we really, I think, would just want to be watching is, right now the main development region, which is in here, is warmer than average. Right now, just off the southeast coast, it's warmer than average, and the Gulf of Mexico is warmer than average. What does all that mean? Well, ocean temperatures are a prime ingredient for developing strong hurricanes. El Nino, if it is still going, would actually say, nope, it's going to shut it down our hurricane season by increasing wind speed. Well, shut it down at times, I should say. Increase wind shear across the Atlantic, you tend to shut these things down. But with these warm temperatures right along the coast, just like last year, we got to worry about what we call homegrown hurricanes. These are the ones that form right next to the coast and then pull in these huge, huge plums of moisture. Now, we can't forecast that today, but it's something we're going to have to watch throughout the rest of the season. So it's a bit of a complicated pattern moving forward, but I guess aren't they all? Uh, and this is what we're looking out for here. You're gonna see with these new model updates, cool and wet is gonna be the main ingredient we see going through the rest of the month of June here and possibly into July. But there are wild cards, and that's why we're gonna have to live within a two week window on our temperature forecasting, and honestly, only within a one week window on our precipitation forecasting. So that's all I've got for you today with our long range forecast. We at Nutrient Ag Solutions hope you look forward to all of our forecasts, but specifically our next long range forecast, which always comes out middle of the day on Wednesdays. Hope you have a great week and we will talk to you soon. Thank you.